Thank you. Very specific, yeah. But that's actually the title of the document that we're producing. My name is Stefan, you know me by now. Um, I'm in Fossil Foundation, and in Fossil Foundation, I lead the effort on the European Commission's roadmap on Open Source CDA, which is a thing we started this summer, and we need to finish this summer, essentially. So uh, <laughs> we are somewhere in the middle between start and end, and it has started six weeks ago, so it gives you a rough outline already. Um, most of you probably know Europe has a CHIPS Act, like every other part of the world has their own CHIPS Act. Um, it was motivated by the ship shortages in, in geopolitics in 2020, um, and it was released in 2022. Uh, Europe has set the goal to gain 20% of market share in ship production, which is pretty much achievable, unachievable, I think, because <laughs> Europe has never, ever had 20%. It was always between 14 and 16%. At the moment, it's at 8% market share, and um, this is quite ambitious. Um, the CHIPS Act defines a framework on how to get there, and part of this framework is funding via the CHIPS joint undertaking, which you probably have heard of. Um, what I find personally pretty important to understand is, at least to me, this is my interpretation of the CHIPS Act or parts of it, um, but you sometimes see a little bit misunderstood by politicians, right? Europe doesn't have to build all the ships that they need on their own, right? It's just like getting the market share to play an important role on the global market. It's not about building, like, it's not the same 20% that we are consuming of the global market, right? It doesn't have to be, the, it's obviously an overlap, but it doesn't have to be entirely. Um, what is really needed is control of the strategic supply chains, like, especially in automotive. There's the theory that they learned a little bit. Again, I strongly doubt it. Uh, but they are very depending on, on many different sources of different kinds of semiconductors getting in. And... Um, um, I think this is essentially the part of the CHIPS Act that's most relevant um, is the discussion around strategic um, um, supply chains and how to ensure that there's no shortages in future. Um, what I also think is important, and this is also how we structured the document in the end and how we came to the focus areas that I will talk about, uh, the idea is that we want to strengthen European focus areas. Like Europe currently is pretty strong, for example, in MEMS, like Bosch is world leader, right? Um, there's like power electronics, Infineon has a good market share in China still, right? There's not much Chinese replacement at the moment. Um, what I don't see as a European focus area, despite what everyone wants, is like having the next NVIDIA killer, right? This is a much longer road um, than looking at where Europe is strong at with everything that's very domain specific to industries, right? That's um, where Europe traditionally had a strength. I don't go into all the details. I think you all agree open source silicon Chip design is very important. It has a lot of great opportunities. It enables innovation. It democratizes uh, technology. And it contributes to the European serenity. That's the main drivers for us to, to look into open source as a whole, right? And I will get into details about open source EDA. At the Risk V Summit Europe this year, Frank from ETH Zurich gave a presentation about their work in open source and how it evolved over time and how the collaboration model is. Um, and he gave this, I think, pretty nice, concise overview about what chip design is and what parts are interesting in there and where we are in open source. Um, so it's a pretty simple, simplified view, but I think most of you are aware of like the different phases that you want to see from RTL to the GDS2. And we took this as a starting point when we, um, when we looked into the, the question about the roadmap. Um, one guiding principle that we try to make very sure from the beginning, and we also try to make sure against people in politics, um, is it's not a, like you have to buy into open source as a whole, right? You don't have to take open source IP with open source EDA tools and open source PDK to build a ship, right? You can still be anywhere in this Venn diagram, right? You can be here, you can be there, you can be in the middle. Middle is great, but everything else is also great, right? Like they all exist without each other. I think this is a very important and very important message also because otherwise you always get into the trap that they are like, oh, you bet you don't have this, right? You, this is not entirely open. Like, it doesn't have to be entirely open. Everything here is useful on the, uh, on the chip end. So if you look back um, at the slide, Frank has a second slide where he um, puts the open source components that we have in there, right? And you see the flow of open source tools down here. You see, like, third-party open source IP, like, from the pulp project, and you see... Um, the open source PDK, for example, from IHP, where we have a talk also tomorrow. <coughs> so if you look at this, you could come to the impression that everything is sorted out already, 
uh, everyone who works with it practically would slightly disagree, I think. Um, so the question is, where are the gaps now, right? Like, that's a bird level view that's good as a messaging, right? Open source is getting there. We can build open source ships on all the different elements we have open sourced. But we want to define the gaps, and in particular in open source EDA, I think there's a lot of important discussions to have about where we need urgent investments into the community. So earlier this year, you maybe saw we published this open letter. This was not a Fossey Foundation effort, but a Stefan the Professor effort. Um, we wrote an open letter to the European Commission because we got aware about the upcoming funding structure of the European Commission pilot lines, which is part of the CHIPS uh, Act framework and the design centers that they are building um, in Europe. And we heard that the role of proprietary EDA tools is more significant than we believe makes sense. So Luca Benini got in touch with me and we drafted this letter and got 500 signatories from academia highlighting the importance of open source EDA tools for education and research in academia. It was focused on academia because we believe that's the most strong message and the most easiest to defend, right? That's a defense line that nobody can break. Academia is like out of, out of touch, right? Like we need something that we can educate people on. For us, it's important to lower the barrier, right? We want new people coming in. It, everyone is talking about like labor shortage. Academia is, is the solution, right? So we made this argument, we had 500 people signing it and we saw some movement and the ships are an undertaking. <coughs> people at DG Connect got in touch with us um, so the CHIPS on undertaking is um, part of the, of the effort now of the um, CHIPS Act framework. Um, the, the task was now that they gave us to define a roadmap, right? So we told them we want open source EDA tool funded and they ask now how do we fund it? What do we fund? What is the gaps that you're talking about? Can you put it into something useful that we can create future funding lines out, right? Um, so the task was uh, given to the GoIT project. We joined them in helping them um, the funding calls will be in 2025, so the funding is already allocated for next year. Now they're waiting for the technical background, what to put into the funding calls. The funding will be 20 million by the European Commission, plus in the joint undertakings, you always have the national co-funding, so half the money comes from the European Commission, the other half comes from your home country. So if you get co-funding by the nationals, they just match it, so it's 40 million which is already a reasonable amount of money, I think, uh, getting into the open source EDA community. Problem is they need it quickly. So they need it by end of November, no, uh, start of November, actually. It's not uh, end of November, it's end of October, early November, they want it published because they need to put it alongside with the uh, working program for next year so that people can understand uh, in which areas the funding would be needed. Um, the process so far was there was a kickoff webinar in May. You can still watch it online. There was, it was like pretty basic presentations, I think, about all the stuff that everyone in the room understands so far already. Then we had a workshop around the Free Silicon Conference in Paris this year, where we had four two hour sessions discussing various parts of the um, open source EDA ecosystem. And since early August, we joined the GoIT project in this very ambitious effort of defining this roadmap in such a short amount of time. Um, the approach that we took from our side, this is Matt and me, uh, Fossey Foundation from GoIT, Sean Paul is also there, um, and Rihard Novix from EDI in Latvia. Um, we decided to just invite a core group that we feel is responding, like somehow representing the community, um, which is a very hard task. And I already know that many people might disagree on some of the names and think other names would be better. But we thought it's a good start to structure the problem a little bit. And um, you can see like it's, I think, across all the different domains that we have in open source EDA, like verification tools, um, FAP and R tools, et cetera. Uh, also like covering not only academia, not only hobbyists, but also industry, also startups that already work in the space was very important to us <coughs> because that's obviously always what the European Commission wants in the end. They want us to help the European industry, European startup ecosystem to be successful. Um, that's, that's always a question that you get in the end, right? Like how can people in the end, after the five years of funding or whatever, what will stay sustainably for the European industry? Um, so we want to tackle it from the beginning. <coughs> so the goal is to create a roadmap that can serve as input to the work program. Well, how it usually works, they get those roadmaps and they define the calls out of the roadmap. They 
took a takes different parts of the work um, of the roadmap and try to structure it into calls and then you get those funding calls that you can apply for with your projects. Um, so the deadline that we set ourselves now is October 31st, um, hopefully a little bit earlier also. The length that they ask us is around 20 pages, which I think is more like a lower barrier that we just get something. We are already approaching 30 pages and most stuff is still bullet points. Um, a little bit of scoping is for us the, that we wanted to have from the beginning is defining focus areas because it also makes those funding calls and everything more structured if you put it into focus areas and say this is important areas for Europe. Um, for each of those focus areas, where are the gaps, right? And this is not only gaps about like, oh, we know like this, this tool is missing. It's also a lot of knowledge might be missing to even build those tools, right? Like we even need to build up expertise to, I don't know, like if I get 20 million and I should do some harmonic stuff, I don't even know who to hire, right? Like, um, it's also building expertise even in those domains again and how to fund this. Um, so what does it need to fill the gaps? What is the reason for those? Um, that's always the hardest part and we didn't really look too deep into the how much does it need because in the end it's up to the projects to define how much it needs and to the reviewers to evaluate if this is correct. Um, but it's also the horizon, right? We differentiate a little bit between short term and more mid to long term ambitions and opportunities. Um, to structure it in a way that they could also have like balanced calls where they fund stuff that has like low hanging fruits or the stuff that's more like long running uh, funding. What's also important to us um, is that we balance the different political interests, like there's a gap a little bit from between like, or just open source doesn't know borders. And on the other side, Europe has to have a strong open source uh, offering on their own, right? So this is like not, to their mental positions, but it's something that the European Commission, of course, considers when they run such programs. Um, but it's definitely a non-goal and also picking up the point before, right? Like we don't write a project proposal. So if you look at the roadmap now, we try to keep it as neutral as possible. And if you disagree on something and you have a consenting view, we will just try to incorporate your consenting view too, right? So we don't have to decide for the right view. <laughs> we just put in, all the options, right? And then the European Commission will write a call with all the options and then there will be projects and in the end some projects will win and others will not win. Um, that's the step where this decision is made, it's not us. Um, why did we decide for those focus areas? Um, for us it's a way to structure it a little bit because otherwise, you know, like if you look at open source EDA from beginning to end, um, this can get very, um, very complex and hard to digest. Um, also, what we wanted to, when we looked at those focus areas, we wanted to pick those focus areas where, where we see the most potential for Europe and also the largest gap possibly, like defining a little bit like this is, like of course, like there's opportunities in analog, right? Or in MEMS and others, um, or photonics, right? Like this is where Europe can be strong, can be innovative and already has a strong foothold. On the other hand, there's stuff that's pretty essential. and. Turns out to us, like after we define those focus areas and you will see them in the next slide, I think. <laughs> like this is just everything. Like Europe is very weak in many fields and others is very strong, but even those need funding. So it turns out those focus areas, you will see essentially just cover everything. Um, we are not sure if this is the right thing now, but it feels like just a good way to structure it into seven, uh, six different focus areas. And those are the ones that we defined. You can see like they are not always relating to a field and a technical process. They can also be more overarching, like the first one, which is productivity, tool interoperability, and flow integration. Like this is very essential, right? If you get feedback from industry, you often hear like, oh, the open source tools are not fully integrated. They are all like islands, they don't work together. Like you can argue about this, but in general, like the same applies to proprietary tools, right? Um, you can't just easily switch them. And this is definitely a an area where open source tools need to be very, um, very focused in from the beginning, I think, to be successful. It doesn't mean you need a flow, like this is, this, this is the one flow that rules everything. It's more about like, how do you make tools better interactable? Like how do you have well-defined interfaces, et cetera. And um, the productivity on the other hand, I believe is something where open source tools can even be useful, right? You get a lot of people say, um, what else do you need to replace? Like which cadence tool do you need to replace next, right? But I think this is the wrong thinking sometimes. Like open source EDA tools also have the opportunity to define new tools, right? You can write tools that there's no proprietary offering at the moment. 
And I think the entire domain of productivity is something where open source can be very, very helpful and where people in industry are not even aware of opportunities because they don't get involved for at the moment, right? Um, so I don't want to restrict it to, or we want to replace open proprietary EDA because I believe there's much more in EDA tools than just replacing what Cadence did for the last 30 years, right? Like we want to build new tools that may convince people. And if you look at, for example, verification and all this Python-based stuff, you can see a lot of people in the industry just being very happy about new opportunities that they just don't have at UVM, right? That's um, one of the motivations. So then we have the focus area of verification, which in the roadmap is more on the RTL or like up to um, uh, going to implementation phase. We also have a little bit about LVS and stuff, um, but it's more than on the digital part. Then we speak about generators and automated layout generation, which is um, on the one side SRAM and other memory generators. Also, we speak a little bit about LLMs and analog design and stuff like this. There's a lot of fancy things you could think about and also a field I think where there can be a lot of innovation. Then we have one focus area that's uh, analog design for mature nodes. I don't really know why we put the mature nodes there because in general, I think the, the idea is that analog doesn't need, it doesn't even benefit anymore from two nanometers, right? Like analog has a certain barrier where you don't pro progress anymore. Um, but that's definitely something that we had in mind from the beginning because it feels like if you look at open source EDA tools, there's not much needed anymore to build an entirely open EDA uh, tool based analog chip, right? If you look into mature digital design, you need much more than you have at the moment. But if you look at some mixed signal or some sensor chip that you might build, open source EDA is already there. The question is what else do we need to really get there? Next thing is digital design. We initially differentiated between mature and advanced nodes, but we merged them recently because we think it's more about, in the end, stuff repeats a little bit and it's more about the maturity of tools and adding more and more extra on top. Um, so it's more like a gradual flow, not a separation between mature and advanced nodes. <coughs> and the last one is heterogeneous integration for Tonics and advanced packaging because uh, they somehow relate and there's a pilot line in the European Commission's um, uh, pilot line program um, for heterogeneous integration and there's which is triplet essentially and also on photonics they have um, interfacing photonics and triplet based designs as a new pilot line so this is definitely something where open source EDA tools already play a role and could play a, an increasingly more important role it's also a new field right this is a new field of research new field of technology open source EDA could be uh, essential there from the beginning those are the focus areas. If you believe we missed something, that's perfectly fine. Just get in touch and tell us and we will try to incorporate it. It's not too late uh, in the middle of the process. The roadmap itself is structured in a few chapters. We do a little bit of introduction and just laying out the field, right? Just defining what EDA tools are, what an EDA flow is, what are the different steps of a ship design, and then go into the importance of open source EDA, why it's imp important for Europe and why we decided for those focus areas. And the main part is like, 20-ish pages around those focus areas. Each of them has a couple of pages um, laying out the need for this focus area and what essentially are the opportunities in there. And we summarize it in the end. And the structure of each of those focus areas is always the same because we try to make it easier to read and easier to digest. <coughs> Further, a brief introduction what it is. And if you look in the document, it always has like industry relevance. We try to link it to European industries or like to um, like, then there has to be like a need that we can define in European industry, which is essentially SMEs, but also enterprises. So it's like not only small and medium enterprises, uh, but also large ones that might have a relevance, like how will the European industry benefit from investments in this focus area? And what we try to do is of course, bring in very recognized names. So if you look at very later, you go to the very later website, you can see many large companies like Intel and Arm officially saying that they're using it because it's, saves the money essentially on IT. Um, then we also have an area of success stories where we just briefly highlight in this focus areas just to create a link that there has been successful open source EDA tools already, right? If you look in each of those focus areas, you can name a few tools maybe that were successful or are successful that are well adopted that, I don't know, like somebody taped out a production ready chip using this tool, um, which we believe is very, important to show that there is some impact already in this area and it's not just creating my academic um, illusion about how I can solve everything with my knowledge, right? Um, 
And then the main part usually is the gaps and necessary improvements where we, for each of the areas, talk a little bit around like where, where are we with open source EDA tools in this field and how could this field benefit or this focus area benefit from open source EDA tools. And this more or less is the main part where we really say like this is like, if you look at verification like this, RTL simulation, the um, stuff like hardware software co-design, like co-simulation, emulation, there's formal verification, just define each of those and say a little bit where we are in open source EDA and how this field can benefit from it. And it always accumulates in a bullet point list and this is actually bullet points of funding opportunities where we just say this is short term or long or mid term funding opportunities where the European Commission can put money in and will get a return on investment that benefits if you go back to European industry. So that's how we try to structure it and make it um, an easy to use handbook to design the calls that we hope that come later. So for the short and mid and long term, the important for the short term is like we think there's a lot of low hanging fruits where we just think, okay, there needs to be some more investment in this field. And then like we could say there's a certain achievement and after that it's optimization, right? Um, there's other stuff that has some kind of urgency where you say, okay, there's some part missing in an open source EDA flow that just always requires you to use a proprietary tool. Like this is something we would say, this is a short term opportunity because this needs investment. Otherwise it will not, uh, not get anywhere. And the others, everything is mid to long term is usually stuff where we say like, okay, this is everything that relates to PPA, et cetera. Like this is something we need investment and this long running investment is sustainable investment. Just a few words about the state of the document. So we got tasked with it early August, which is like the worst time in Europe to start something. You got five minutes. I have five minutes, yeah, but I'm nearly done. But, all right. Any time for questions? <laughs> Let's just do the last slide. Um, so we had holidays in between, so we are not there where we wanted to be, but we are already approaching a stage where we can review, um, start review and sharing it now. We have around 30 pages. Many parts at the moment are bullet points, but it is not a bug, it's more a feature. That's the way how we structured it for ourselves to put in like the talking points that we have a train of thought that everyone can follow and add and um, comment on. Um, they are at varying ma grade of majority as usually, right? Some people are faster, some like me are not so fast in getting everything in there that they have in their head. Um, so we bring it to the best stage for review. We wanted to release it today. We'll probably not release it today, but on Sunday, the latest, maybe tomorrow, we hope. Um, there's still some, some work to be done. We will tell everyone in the room when it's on the website, we'll put it on the Bosposi website, along with a review form. That's the call for action now, ending it. So we hopefully, I believe we created a useful structure. I think the focus areas are pretty much covering everything. Um, Maybe we had some incomplete information. So for example, I talked about MEMS earlier. We found that there's no meaningful MEMS open source EDA involvement at the moment. And we don't really see how this is a mark, like a domain that you can enter without being in a domain already. So we don't have a focus area on MEMS. We, we see a little bit of the mechanical stuff if you go to advanced packaging, right? It has uh, MEMS aspects in there, but we don't have a specific MEMS focus area. Um, if you know about something that's going on in this area that's very useful, just um, just give it to us and we can integrate it. I think that's, that's, that's an option. Um, we will put the review document online, then we will ask for your input. There will be an input form that we put along with it on the website. Um, we ask you to try to like just submit the form multiple times with different topical items, right? Don't try to put up a long text and we have to go through it and then forget about parts that you said, like for every argument you're making, just submit once, right? It's much easier for us to track and to say, okay, this is solved, this is solved, this is solved. Um, also try to stay short. When we have questions, we will get back to you, like be nice to us, right? This is also voluntary work, like we don't get paid for this um, at the moment. Um, and we also, like, if you disagree on something and say, okay, this is not an opportunity, like, Maybe you can state it, but in general, I think we will not remove stuff unless we really all agree that it's something that's not an opportunity because in the end, as I said, like we don't have to agree on a common project, right? We have to agree on a common roadmap that everyone feels reflects in, right? I think um, this is not about a competition who does the best open source EDA. It's a joint effort to get money to the community. I think that's important to keep in mind. 
Yes, yeah, so we we'll put a review form along with it. Um, that's the best way for us to structure it. Just summarizing, then we get the questions. Um, so we will put the first draft release uh, out for the community discussion in the next two days. Um, after that, we ask you to submit your thoughts and proposals. Um, it would be great to engage early, like don't wait until last minute and submit 200 <laughs> individual form submissions. That would be really helpful. Um, also, it would be great if you are ready to be more involved if you have more questions, jump on a call with us. That was very useful. Like, we already reached out to some people that we did like interviews with, like a half hour meeting over Zoom, just getting their, their thoughts on different items and just putting it into document and then structure it later. That's very useful. Um, October 6th is our deadline for community input and by October 13th, we want to have document finished, which is very ambitious. So there's a one week grace period for us to do the heavy lifting. And then we have professional editing for the entire document that we have booked for the end of October. And that it is a very good form in the end also. So thank you very much. That is the current ambition. You probably heard about it. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the community to, to do this. I think there will be a lot of disappointments in the end when the money gets out in the, the wrong pockets, you would think. But I think that's like if we get the opportunity, we should use it to influence it in a way that we find useful. So thank you very much. Get engaged. Get in touch with me, Matt, John Paul, right? That's the easiest way. And then we can incorporate you much earlier into the next process for Thank you very much. Okay. We don't have time for questions. One minute. Um, yeah. We started five minutes late, right? Did we? Yeah. I don't think we did. Anyway. Um, do you want to say something about the Sunday session? What would you talk there? Because that could be an opportunity for people to maybe come along and, and get in. Yeah, so that's also this. like, I, I'm hoping to, that we get the document out tomorrow, that people have a little bit of time to at least, like, I think everyone in the room has, that works in Open CDA has their focus area, right? You don't want to read the entire document, you just want to read the focus area that applies to you. It's two to three pages. I think that's a good entry point. And then in the morning, the idea was, would be like, I just open the document and you tell me what to put in. <laughs> That's the easiest, right? And we just have a joint session where people can make suggestions. We maybe get some new thoughts. We try to structure them later. I think that would be a good idea for, for Sunday morning. Yeah, OK. All right, a couple of quick questions now. Oh. <coughs> Do you already have a sense how the project calls will be structured? Will it be like an LNET 50K? Or will it be for SMEs 50% own co-funding? Yes and yes and yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, this, like this we brought up, obviously. So there's multiple issues with joint undertaking funding, right? Academia only gets 70%, which is a nightmare because I don't have the other 30%. So <laughs> <laughs> like I have to get it somewhere. The idea was originally that industry gives it, right? It turns out industry is not so good at giving money to academia if they don't have to. <laughs> um, so the... In, and hobbyists don't have access, right? Like you can't apply like the paperwork that you had to do to get European money is insane, right? So you can't just apply as hobbyists. So we already talked to them and told them like, you need to structure in a way like NLAT, LNAT is, or like the sovereign tax one. Like you need some intermediary projects that get the other 30% somewhere else, right? And then you would try to distribute 100% grants to individuals. Um, they agreed, they see the issue, especially in this field. Um, and that's up for discussion after we finish the roadmap. <laughs> that's the next document probably to write, right? <laughs> um, thank you for this. Um, I, 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 I speak now with a very heavy heart. Would there be any problems at all if I actually then sent this to the three local MPs in Cambridge? Why Just not? to rub the night in. <laughs> yeah. Great. Show. Yeah, you can involve whoever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we also <laughs> No, I think the UK is currently part of the European funding structure, basically. Well, I hope so. Uh, yeah. The same applies to Israel, right? Well, uh, the, the UK is part of Horizon, uh, but not part of this EU. Okay. So, and the ship that we were going to ship and the boat are both in the UK. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Program. Sorry, just briefly repeat. So, UK is currently in Horizon, but not in Digital Europe. Chip JU is something different. It gets money from initiative and non-initiative. This is the one is Horizon as initiative, I think. 
and Digital Europe is not an initiative. This is not an initiative, so UK will not be automatically in there, but I think we need to ask them. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I personally think we need to go to um, a member of parliament ASA button to discuss this in that time. Sure. Yeah. All right, we'll have to leave it there, everyone. Um, thank you, Stefan. Stefan will be around all weekend, as I'm sure you're aware, and keep your eyes peeled for details on the Sunday session on this. Cool. All right, thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much.